So today is the last day of formal negotiations here at COP21 to get an assessment of where things stand. We're joined by Torsten Thiele. He is of the Global Ocean Trust, a climate finance expert specialising in the oceans. Torsten, welcome. Where is your assessment of, of how we've moved from week one into week two to today? I think we made a good splash. Oceans came up in the discussions. We managed to raise the profile of what is two-thirds of the planet. We managed to make it clear and got some nations behind the 1.5 target because if we don't reach that goal, we will have real challenges for ocean and coastal communities. However, where we are now is that a lot of that great effort is not reflected in the text. And this is where the real challenge lies. We have a text that is stripped to the bare bones, understandably, in order to get to a conclusion. So good news is we're making progress. Good news is everybody's at the table. Bad news is that the additional ambition that we need, that is the one we have to keep working on. And are you hopeful that we'll, we'll, we'll get there or we'll get something that at least can be worked on after this COP? I think that that is the good news. I think the negotiators are focusing on, on getting an agreement in place. Having that in place will allow us to bring this broader message, which was very well supported. We had a number of activities around the main negotiations that really showed that the oceans are at the table. The insurance industry understands the resilience and flood risks and is really here. There have been a lot of efforts from the NGO, from the uh, civil society and, and from the business community to make that push. Now we need to raise that ambition and I think the outcome of this COP, which I am still confident will be a real agreement, will allow us then in the follow-on in Marrakesh in 2016 to really bring in key issues like how does ocean climate finance fit into this equation, what can it contribute. Always at these meetings um, the choice of words is extremely important and there's lots of nuance put on, on words. The term ecosystem integrity is one such example. Can you unpack that a bit for us in terms of the ocean? Um, I think that is actually a very helpful way to start to understand that we are talking about a system and that complexity of that climate system is very dependent on the ocean as being part of it. So the ocean community will now be able to use that as a way of explaining how that interaction works and how therefore ocean solutions need to be part of the overall climate solutions. Comparing this COP to previous COPs, do you sense there is a significant difference in the appreciation of the importance of the ocean in this big picture? I think the big turning point in this whole process which led to this COP has really been about inclusiveness, about everybody being at the table. And that means not only that now all nations have made their INDCs on board, it also means that the global systems and areas like forests and oceans have come more to the table. Now I, I was hoping to have an INDC for the ocean at this COP. We haven't quite gotten to that level yet, but anybody who tries to understand the scale of the challenge that we have in front of us needs to see that ocean solutions are actually not only part of the puzzle, that is where that is the front line of a lot of the change. It's in the acidification, it's in the fact that the ocean's ability of giving us every second breath that we take is being compromised. So it affects all of us and it needs to be in here and that understanding is coming along at all levels. Because to me it seems as though in the past there's been lots of focus on uh, the impact of climate change on human beings on land and on forests and I wonder, as you say, whether, whether there is an understanding now that in fact if we don't sort the impact on the oceans out, really that's the front line. I think at this COP the island nations have done a wonderful job of showing their vulnerability and sharing it with everybody so that people understood that we already have a number of cases where this effect is so visual and so relevant and therefore it gives us all away to be part of understanding those solutions because the effects will come to everybody. But it's also the natural resilience of that system, of that larger system on the planet, that is the crucial line to help us through this process. We hear a lot about blue carbon at this COP. Can you explain that? We have 
wonderful ecosystems along coastlines, mangroves and seagrasses, etc., that are actually very effective at storing carbon. So they provide a massive carbon sink, but not only are they a huge mitigation factor, they actually key part of adaptation. What we've now starting to learn and understand, and this is really exciting, is that the broader ocean has a whole range of carbon pumps, that all the life in the ocean is a key part of that, and that protecting and working and understanding with those parts are just as critical in order to protect that huge ability of the ocean to absorb carbon and help us store it in the long term. So when people talk about um making sure fish stocks, for example, are healthy, making sure corals are, if possible, preserved or regrown. That is about building resilience, which in turn helps the carbon cycle. That's exactly right. And so as we have more fish in the sea, as fish have a nice working tropical trophic pyramid of the whole system, that is where the power lies. And, and every whale protected, every parrotfish that helps the coral reef, every part of a functioning marine ecosystem is actually a key part of it fighting the, the climate change challenge. So bringing those two together is what we really need to communicate. Torsten, thanks very much indeed for talking to us.